Hello, and welcome to season three of Sal Sylvester on the Future of Leadership. I am Sal Sylvester, your host and founder and CEO of 512 Solutions, an executive coaching and leadership development firm based here in Boulder, Colorado, helping organizations create healthy, aligned, and more human workplaces. I'm also the founder and CEO of Coach Metrics, a cloud-based leadership development tool designed to measure behavioral change in our executive coaching programs. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the future of leadership. And to kick off this season, we have an expert in this space to share some amazing insight with us. His name is Dr. David Paul Metter. He is a full professor of psychology at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania, as well as a fellow of the American Psychological Association. Dr. David is a board certified clinical psychologist with over 30 years of private practice experience. Finally, he's consulted with numerous organizations around how to promote resilience, as well as how to manage burnout and compassion fatigue. In this episode, he's going to share a ton of insights to help you and to help others build resistance in yourself and the people around you, both at work and beyond. Let's go to the interview with Dr. David Palmetter now. So David, as we talked about before the show, the theme for, uh, for our season for the next quarter is really about resilience. And everybody has been through so much this year, the global pandemic, economic uncertainty. We've got kids at home from school. We've got weather events happening. And not to mention all of the complexity and uh, the unpredictability, the ambiguity in our workplace. So I'm excited to have you on the show today uh, because you're not only a practicing clinical psychologist, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a coach, a professor, an author, and an expert on mental health and resilience, wellness. So thank you for being here. And I'd love to start off with what are you noticing in our world today? Well, first, it's my pleasure to be here, Sal. I appreciate your energy, too. Um, you know, we're all living down a rabbit hole. None of us have had this experience before. And the cumulative stress, as well as our pre-existing vulnerabilities, seem to be uh, significantly taxing our mental health. Many people don't know this, but the Census Bureau has been doing a survey every couple of weeks of the nation's mental health. And this morning, I just crunched the numbers from the most recent edition, was, which was from um, first two weeks in September. And what they found is that 52% of Americans report feeling down, depressed, or hopeless at least several days a week. Wow. So that's, that's a sample of over, over 200 million adults. Likewise, uh, they asked how many frequency of feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge. And 63% of adults said they feel that way at least several days a week. If you bump it up a little bit and say, how many feel each of those things more than half the time? 21% the depression, one in five. And 30% the anxiety, one out of three. So it's now normative to mm. have significant experiences of depression and anxiety. And you probably know this, this data, uh, depression is the number one cause of workplace absenteeism or in the National Institute of Mental Health and costs businesses each year about $44 billion. Wow. So when you add um, the factors of burnout, morale, bullying at the workplace and the COVID stress, it's just a mighty, mighty burden. I mean, I, I wonder if the etymology of COVID-19 is to get one's teeth kicked in. Um, mm. And so when people walk around declaring, oh, everything's awesome, you know, it, it's, it's, it's nothing but greatness. Um, I, I wonder, you know, either what they're selling or what kind of insecurity they might have because all of us have some degree of loss these, these days. And being authentic with that is important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a universality of it, if that's even a word, element to this, which is, and I was, I was talking with my wife, Rachel, just this week, and uh, even just discussing how we both just kind of felt meh. You know, at times of, 
um, I probably wouldn't call it depression, but definitely feeling down. And there's this element of like a global sadness that, that really does, I think if we're paying attention, really does impact everybody globally. We're, we're in some ways all in this together. I, I, the thing I say with my um, clients I've been counseling is um, that they relate to is we're not walking around in air anymore. It's like we're walking around in maple syrup. It's like one of those dreams where you're just so sluggish and you mm-hmm. can't move. And I think that's why regular doses of self-compassionate grieving are so important. If we just jump right to strategies, some of which I'm sure we'll talk about today, yeah. and don't do the grieving first, it's like painting over rust. So interesting. And so also if we don't do the grieving and we try to tamp it down, bury those feelings alive, um, they're not buried dead, they're buried alive and they get zombified and they end up like zombies in movies, attacking in surprising and destructive ways later hmm. on. All of a sudden yelling, all of a sudden I'm crying, what the, or a person has a glass or two of this or that and they're finding themselves acting in ways that are atypical. Well, it can be because of a buried alive pain. So taking some regular time, um, you know, everybody's different, a couple times a week, once a week, but just focusing on what are my losses and allow myself to have an authentic experience of that without self-blame uh, or uh, getting into blaming of others, which is the self-compassion piece. Yeah, so interesting because you know our theme is resilience here, and yet if we don't recognize these emotions, if we don't recognize how we're feeling, it's, we can't be, it's hard to be resilient. It's hard to make it through these times. And part of what I've know about resilience is it's, it's about tackling, tackling adversity and, and bouncing back. But you can, you can experience these multiple emotions. It's not about hiding your emotions or pretending that everything's great or ignoring um, things that are around you. So I, I'd love to talk more about this grieving piece because, you know, even as that comes up for, as you say that, you know, I think about my own experience and I've been so focused this year of being aware of my state of mind and really trying to stay positive and really trying to change the meaning of, the experiences that I've been having. And at the same time, I can't help to notice a sense of sadness or loss. So you just started telling us this, but how do we go about taking time to do that grieving? Well, it's important not to conflate depression with grief because they Mm -hmm. can feel the same, but they're very different. Depression involves um, an internal enemy. You know, I like Stephen King's line, ghosts are real, monsters are real too. They live inside us and sometimes they win. So depression is like an internal enemy. It's a lying liar that distorts truth. Depression needs no time from us. Actually, when I work with clients through cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm caging their internal depression. It's all about, you know, disempowering it because it's not, it's based on things that aren't true. Grief, however, represents Mm -hmm. true loss and that has to get dealt with differently that needs to be authentically experienced yeah we have so much data on this if we if we don't experience it legitimately we become at risk for complicated grief where time stops and you just become trapped in this uh, suffering so one way to do this is to create stillness you know Mm -hmm. try a couple times a week even if it's for 10 minutes I use uh, Dr. Kristen Neff's um, exercise where you close your eyes, put your hand on your heart, and imagine yourself as a vulnerable child. Hmm. And then pull to mind what you're feeling, what losses you have. If it's self-compassionate, you're not doing things in your head like, oh, well, but I haven't, you know, no one's died or I still have my job. You're not mitigating your loss with that kind Hmm. of hostile comparison. You know, what you're doing is just authentically owning what, what your loss is. For those folks who, who live a lot in their heads, um, you know, I sometimes am guilty of that. Hmm. I have a couple YouTube videos I can send you that can prime getting in touch with what we're feeling. Not, not 
not escalated or not created, but just get us more in touch. There's some nice COVID themed uh, YouTube videos that are, are very, very uh, emotional. And then that's, ter- the that's time terrific, by the way. We'll, we'll put those up on our uh, podcast episode page for our listeners so they can tap into those. Great. And then the first step is to be empathic. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes in families or with our children or whatever, we jump right to reassurance. And that is not a full experience. We have to be empathic of what we're feeling, and then we can follow up with reassurance. Yeah. So I, I have a couple follow-up questions for this. And, and the first is around empathy. I was re- recently coaching a, a CEO of a fast-growing high-tech company, highly successful man who's doing incredible work in our world for patient outcomes. And he said, one, he doesn't, he doesn't have empathy. And number two, he doesn't understand the importance of empathy. How, how do you respond to that? Well, um, his banquet um, is, that his mission can realize has just been cut in half at least. Hmm. So to, to be able to experience uh, some version you know, of another person's thoughts and feelings. Empathy is different from compassion or sympathy. Empathy is, I'm, I'm actually, it's connected knowing what one uh, psychoanalyst call it. It's ha- experiencing some version of the other. And this is very important in connectedness, which is connect social, connect, quality of social connection is the one predictor, number one with a bullet, of both physical and mental health long term. There, there's nothing else. The number two factor is a distant second. I'm talking, you can do brain scans, you can measure, do blood analysis, you can see how much people are exercising or doing yoga or praying or whatever. And nothing better predicts in longitudinal research, physical and mental health better than social connection. Try having social connection of a high quality without empathy. Good luck. Lots of luck. Yeah. That's fascinating. I love that because... Um, You know, to me, none of this that we're talking about is soft. And I I can't stand in my line of work, training, coaching, we often refer to some of these skills as soft skills. But these are the things that ultimately accelerate business results. They accelerate trust on teams, the ability to have the meaningful conversations and really understanding the, the importance of connectedness and the link to empathy, that's powerful for any person, any human being, but especially if you're a corporate leader, I hope you just heard that. And you know, the thing about that point too, Sal, it's so important is, you know, I'm not just some academic waxing philosophic. This is all based in hard science mm. and decades of hard science. So every statement I'm making I flash into the back of my mind is the meta analysis or the, you know the, the the peer reviewed comprehensive review of the literature that supports what I'm saying. And if I deviate from that, I'll say this is anecdotal, this is just based in my clinical experience. Yeah. So this is all based on very well constructed peer reviewed science. Hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. We have a, a model that we use in our work. We call it the human workplace needs model. And it's you know, it's kind of a uh, a build uh, from maybe, you know, the, the, the uh, hierarchy of needs, Maslow's thinking, but specifically for the workplace and the, at the base level of that model, we have connection with others. The second we have certainty, which to us really means psychological safety, the ability to feel safe without um, feeling like if you contribute, if you share a different opinion or a new idea or cr- some creativity, you're not going to be humiliated or marginalized. So connect, it's interesting because that's really, that, that whole idea of connection to me has always been anecdotal, just my sort of experience in the field, but you're saying it's backed by years of research and peer review. One of the resources I'll send you that your listeners can tune into is a TED Talk of the Harvard Adult Development Study by uh, Dr. Waldinger. And this study is about 80 years old now. And in this TED Talk, he reviews the comprehensive medical and psychological and biosocial data they collect and how overwhelming it is that at age 50, the best predictor of how you're going to be doing later in life is not anything that's going to come out on a blood um, 
blood lab test or hmm. any brain scan, it's going to be the quality of your social connectedness. Wow. By far and away the top predictor. Hmm. And so those interested in the, at least sort of an overview of the science on this point can t- tune into that TED Talk. So powerful. Okay, so now for many people and for most corporations or businesses, we are working in a remote workplace and we're missing in many ways the connectedness that we had in the office, walking around, bumping into people at the, the, the metaphorical water cooler or walking in between meetings to conference rooms. How do we build connectedness in a virtual world? Any, First of all, I think we have, to own, own, yeah. we have to own that it's, it's not going to be equal. Mm-hmm. Right? I think we have to forget about that. Uh, and that's also a research-based statement. It's not going to be equal. But it's also not going to be a barren desert. Right. You know, it's, it's going to be sort of, a, you know, an achromatic, clever version of what we used to have chromatically with each other. On my um, blog, I'm leaving it up there as the most recent entry, is a list of about three dozen different fun things people can do. I saw and be so distance. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like, one of my favorites is the game Quiplash, for instance. Um, you know, you, it's a very funny, entertaining game you can do with people remotely. Mm-hmm. I think at the, at the workplace, um, you know, a, a couple of things, if I was master and commander of a, of a, of a, of a business, I'd be interested in having some me- methodology for people to uh, have support groups, mm-hmm. online support groups. And that's different by, by business, how it's stratified and structured. But, you know, I would ask my EAP folks, if I had one, can you guys provide these different themes, you know, economic stress, interpersonal stress, families or parenting, couples. Uh, that's one thing I would do. I would also um, have webinars, burnout, compassion fatigue, COVID coping or webinars. And there's, there's a small army of psychologists like me who are willing to do this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, thirdly, I would want to make sure my employees understand about cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes. In that, in that uh, survey I mentioned, the U.S. Census Bureau, they also asked how many people were receiving counseling. Nine percent. Nine percent. How many were receiving prescription medication? Twenty percent. Those numbers drive me crazy. Right. Both in the number of under service. Imagine we thought that about of our dental health. To have dental problems is normative, but only nine percent of people are getting are getting help for it, care for it. And then the the, the, the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is is a, a meanly marketing machine and has this idea that medications are the solution or should be the number one solution, where with anxiety and depression, cognitive behavioral therapy is so often more preferred. So if I was an employer, I would want to be having some sort of newsletter communication with my employees about cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, a little bit, because I think there are some techniques or tools that we can learn to use as leaders. I know that in some of our productive conflict work, we bring in some CBD techniques around recognizing an event, an automatic thought that you might feel, and then uh, interrupting that pattern and reframing. What are some, are there any practical tools that we can leave our listeners with right now to either change the meaning of what they're experiencing or to change their response to what they're experiencing. For me, the first step is, is just recognizing what internal enemies I have, because we all have mm-hmm. different vulnerabilities. Our internal enemies re- reinterpret truth around us. I mean, truth is difficult to, to understand with an objective lens, but if you're listening to everything through an internal enemy, so whatever it is, I think it's important to identify that, because each of those enemies, anxiety, depression, addiction, anger, they have different ways of interpreting. Mm. And then you can do something called thought testing. That's one thing uh, where you write down the thought that's painful. Nobody likes me. I'm a bad leader. Um, you know, people, people are selfish and 
cruel. And then you thought test it and treat it like a trial. So you collect the evidence, the objective evidence that supports the thought. And then you collect the objective evidence that is disconfirmatory of the thought. And you yeah. see where the evidence lies. When, mm. it's, when it's a pain born out of an internal enemy, uh, it's always going to be more on the evidence side. It's going to be that the thought isn't true. Another thing is something we call coping thoughts. Mm -hmm. Just developing a list of true things that are uplifting. The categories I use are true things about me that are, that, that are synergizing when I think about them. True things about circumstances of my life. Things I'm looking forward to. And fourthly, uh, things that are inspirational. Me. Yeah, and carry those around, and and just like we can take off an uncomfortable uncom pair of jeans and put on something comfortable, mm -hmm. we can do the same thing with our thoughts. It'd be ridiculous yes. to see someone walking around with jeans going, "Oh, these hurt, hurt, hurt." But yeah, yeah, that's what we do with our thoughts all the time, and mm -hmm. we don't have to. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I love the the phrase "internal enemies." Um, there's a technique that we often will will use in our coaching or teach other people and it's when you recognize that thought ask three questions to help interrupt it and reframe it number one uh number is it true is the thought that i'm having actually true it sounds like that's really tied into your thought testing like if i look at the facts or the evidence without distorting it what is actually true here the second question is how might i be exaggerating the current situation um, and then the third question is really a question around the reframe, which is, how could I see this differently? Very, very good questions. I mean, these internal enemies of ours uh, hate us. Depression's mm -hmm. end game is our death. Anxiety's end game is total isolation. Hmm. Substance abuse's end game is you and me, babe, nobody else. Right. So they're cruel, and the and the the line is incessant, and they attack us when we're at our weakest and most stressed. Yeah, without a doubt, uh, it's really helpful. You, you talk about this concept of meaning making, and uh, the way that I interpret that, and tell me if uh, you you see it differently, is that we attach a meaning to an experience or an event that we have, and the meaning that we attach to it is entirely in our control. Uh, so maybe there's a loss of a job as an example, and someone attaches meaning of I'm not good enough or hopelessness or, uh, but someone else might attach this a different meaning uh, like, Hey, there's an opportunity here for me to move into a different aspect of my career. What, what do you, uh, how do you see the concept of meaning making and why is that important? So it starts with how we think about what resilience means. Mm -hmm. In one facet of the literature, resilience is getting on the other side, surviving it. But another facet I think is better. It's the one I align my scholarship up with. And that is true resilience. You arrive on the other side of the stress, stronger, wiser, better. Mm. And so the question becomes, what can we do that's under our control? Because some things are temperamental or outside of our control what can we do under our control that will promote post-traumatic growth? So mm -hmm. the hit makes us stronger, wiser, better. So I, I have a little statue in my office. I work with all my clients. Um, the idea is that our pain is a dragon guarding treasure. Mm. We have to experience a dragon first. There's yeah. no getting around it. We have to have the, we, we don't like that. We don't like to suffer. You know, if I was, if I was around there writing the constitution, I wouldn't say put in pursuit of happiness. I'd say put in pursuit of high road living because knowing how to suffer wisely is such a key part wow. of any high road life or any realized mission. And so we have to know how to experience the dragon's clients. If it doesn't kill us or trap us, it flies away. And the treasure is at least equal to the dose of pain. So the greater the pain, the greater the treasure, if we know to look for it. And that's where the meaning making comes in. And the scholarly research is clear. The best predictor, when people suffer a trauma, there's a, you know, if you think of a, a path that they're going to go on one or two roads, <clears throat> the best predictor of being on a post-traumatic growth road is meaning making. And that doesn't mean that you say, okay, the pain was worth it. Like sometimes the, 
the pain is, is the death of a, of a child or the loss yeah. of a job or cancer. And we, it's not like we're saying, okay, yay, but that's not the case. What we say is, okay, that was terrible. The dragon was, was cruel and vicious, but I'm on the other side of it now. Where's the treasure? And the dose, the more the pain, the greater the treasure. You know, I sent you an exercise I used to have te clients teach that to themselves, almost like you prove an algebraic equation. And I'll mm -hmm. send you a link for it so people can download that themselves Great. if they want. It's terrific. And do the exercise and prove it to you by just looking at past pains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, you sent me an exercise on that you mentioned post traumatic growth. And there is a question in there that was really powerful. It's what you just referred to, but reflect on ways that your life might be better or you may be an improved person because of the pain that you went through. That's a deep question. And you could do it the other way. You know, mm -hmm. list, the, list the top, the things you most value in your life and ask, was there any suffering that I had to go through to get to this place? And it's amazing to me when I, when I think of my own top pains that I've experienced, the things that almost ended me, and I make that list, and then I make the list of the things that matter most to me, they're directly tied. Wow. They're directly tied. I had to have that, those worst pieces of suffering in order to have the best things in my life right now. Hmm. It couldn't have existed without it. What a connection. What a connection mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, other disciplines besides psychology have known this for a long time. It's just that psychology is the empirical science of the human condition, and we're just catching up. And our research mm -hmm. now supports some of these ancient deep truths. Yeah, it's so interesting because more and more what I'm seeing in the Western world are Eastern traditions from mindfulness to uh, you know, meditation techniques, breathing techniques, uh, those are becoming more and more of the norm, even in the corporate world, right? Like the, you know, the, the guarded, uh, I've got to be strong corporate leader, even some of those, I think the best leaders are starting to embrace some of those philosophies and practic uh, uh, just practically speaking, some daily habits. This is why I like a liberal arts education. There's a debate in academia should courses all just be selected based on anticipated career mm -hmm. and i'm against that because when you when you consider these same truths from the lives perspectives of other disciplines you get a level of sophistication nuance and, mm -hmm. and you say more so yeah. what, like a lot of the reading i do on my own are from business experts or philosophy philosophers or theologians or other other disciplines besides mine because it's the same truths but it's like if the truth is a landscape, a field in a forest, I'm coming from the north direction as a psychologist looking at the truth, and they're coming from the south. It's the same truth, but they have other angles on it that enrich it. And so mm -hmm. when you refer to these traditions, that's what I, th I think of that. You know, these, yeah. these deep traditions have so much to synergize our own understandings. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I just had a, a moment of blank. I, I was going to say something and I, um, I forgot what it was. Um, I'll just keep going. So for, the, uh, for my uh, production folks, you can edit my little stumble here. Uh, <laughs> since we're going to edit, edit this anyway. Um, oh, darn it. There's something good in there. I, I just, I Take think that's, time. yeah, I think that's just such a really, uh, interesting point. All right. Well, I'll just keep moving, and if if I remember if I remember it, I'll come back to it. Um, you mentioned a an exercise you have. It's about a three minute exercise. Yes. Interrupting the fight flight response. I think it would be super cool if you could walk us through that and. For folks that are on the call, or I'm sorry, on this podcast, listening to this, this is this would be a great exercise for us all to uh, to experience. So, the fight and flight activates something called the sympathetic nervous system in the brain, and it's so critical. Like if you're in your house, you have a two story house, and your bedroom's the top floor, and you hear shattering of glass on your in your first floor, 
your fight flight response activates instantly. And thank God it does because we become mean, lean, fighting or fleeing machines. Our brains, our hearts, our muscles, every system in the body changes. Mm. But that same response, I mean, imagine if you're in that, that way you are, if you think someone's breaking in and, and you're in a situation where someone's coming to you and they need empathy or you're trying to solve a life problem, you know, how yeah. you're gonna retire. I mean, you, you would suck at it. So what happens with anxiety is anxiety convinces us that kittens are tigers hmm. and the sympathetic nervous system fires when there's no true threat and so this technique this three minute technique i'm about to cover is just sort of a, uh you know if you thought use the baseball analogy maybe like a single a level intervention right. and then there's other things along the train that, that get you up to the major league level intervention but this why well, i use this three minute exercise just to illustrate to people how even three minutes can make a difference. When you act, a, when you uh, do this exercise, it's like a ticking bomb in the movie where they clip a wire and then it just stops. Mm -hmm. So this three minutes just short circuits the sympathetic nervous system. Awesome. So can, do, can I jump yes, in please. real quickly? Because I just want to relate this to the corporate workplace. So much of the change that we see at work is direct is directly or perce can be perceived as threat whether it yeah. is uh, you need to move your desk to a different part of the office or your manager has feedback for you. Like it can trigger um, this sympathetic nervous system and our fight or flight response. And those are minor things. Imagine going through a, a business reorganization or all of a sudden now people are working from home instead of in the workplace. So, I think this is really key. A lot of what we can experience in the workplace can be perceived as threat where we move to that fight or flight response. So this technique's really gonna help us practically in the workplace. Yeah, that's a concept reviewed in Who Moved My Cheese, you know, that classic. Right. Yes, well, yeah. yeah so um, I'll start the three minutes in a second. First, if, if you're listening in, just close your eyes and try to sit as comfortably as you can so if it's possible, rest your head against uh, wherever you are. If you're able to do it, kick off shoes and get rid of any jewelry or belts that are constricting you, feel tight on you. Okay, I'm gonna start now. Let's first bring our your attention to your breath. I want you to breathe into the lowest part of your stomach. So pretend that your lungs are there and not in your chest and breathe in more deeply than you would normally with a one second pause at the top and then breathe in out more deeply. So if we had a potato chip on your chest and one on your belly, the one on your chest would barely move and the one on your belly would rise and fall so as to be discernible from across the room. Now we're gonna walk through your muscles and when I name the muscle, don't move it, but just try to use your mind to see if you can get it more relaxed. A relaxed muscle is like a cooked piece of pasta. It's heavy, it's warm, and it's soft. So let's relax your fingers and hands. And now your lower arms. Feel them settling more deeply into whatever they're resting on. And now your upper arms. In a completely relaxed state, it can almost feel like your arms are pulling out of your shoulder sockets. And now your shoulders and neck. And now your jaw and tongue. Some people, when they relax their jaw, their mouth wants to open. If you're one of those people, let that happen. Relax your cheeks, your eyes. Make your forehead as smooth as a pond on a summer morning. Relax your chest, which could be barely moving. Relax your belly. 
which is breathing in and out deeply as rhythmically as the waves at the beach. Relax your upper legs and your lower legs and your feet, ankles, and toes. Now try, try taking an extra deep breath into your lower stomach and letting it out slowly. And once again. Okay, that's three minutes on the nose. Um, a lot of people are surprised because I, you know, I used to in the more the in the more AAA version. There's a half hour tense relax exercise, mm-hmm. and people up. I have to find a half hour. Well, everybody's got three minutes. Yeah, I mean, President Obama's got three minutes. Right. You know, a day. So we can do that, and you can do it in a car, in a bathroom stall. You know, any place where you get a, a private moment. I feel terrific. I just went through that exercise. By the way, for folks that are listening to this, Dr. David just held up his phone to show that was exactly three minutes. And yeah, it's incredible how little time it takes to completely change. For me, my focus is clear. My physiology is completely different. And if I'm a leader thinking about getting ready to give a presentation or a speech, or maybe I've got a difficult conversation coming up of any sort. I am in a much more intentional state after three short minutes than where I was before that. You work a lot with CEOs. The CEO of the brain is the prefrontal cortex. And when the fight flight response is triggered, that part of the brain takes a nap. We all lose IQ points. And Hmm. so this brings back the prefrontal cortex and I'm more likely to be able to act with intention. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, that's the word right there that we use so often in our work, which is intention. And Mm -hmm. taking the time to really think about how we're all showing up with intention on purpose can make all of the difference in our world and in our workplace. David, thank you so much for being here with us today. This has just been absolutely fascinating and incredible. David's going to give us a number of resources. We'll post those on our uh, website so you can access the some of those tools and YouTube videos and, and other resources out on our episode page. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Sal. Thanks for having me and being a great interviewer.